I saw these guys working and I was worried that they were actually demolishing it so my heart kind of skipped a beat and then I found out that they were renovating it and that kind of brightened it up because to see it you know alive and well again will be a really awesome experience because this area is so historic already. Right now we're down in the lowest part and this is where foundations get put in down here in the mud. Actually, it's not mud. I want to make a slight distinction. It's extremely good earth here. We have bearing capacity here, which is exceptional. We happen to come in an area where we have this decomposed stone as the bearing soil. You can see how hard it is to break. Great soil, great soil. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a good omen. Many, many, many ages have taken place here. Over the 120 years this building's been renovated and remodeled and changed hands. One of the things that's really beautiful about this process are the walls. You just see so many different parts of what happened in the past. Down here, we see a little bit of Greek fret, which probably was in the original movie theater. It was called the Dunbarton back then. Historically, the only thing left is this little piece of arch from the Gothic silent movie theater. Over the years, the facade was refurbished several times. The iconic neon sign went up and it became the Georgetown Theater in 1945. The 1958 remodeling went level from the street all the way to the back. But underneath it was the slope seating area of the original movie theater. So when we removed the recent structure, then the old structure below at the original movie theater was exposed. I have a very strong commitment to historic Georgetown. It's where my office is, where I've done a lot of different projects over time. Everything is interesting. I'm an architect. I love architecture. I was always committed to restoring this building. I had restored Francis Scott Key House, and two other 1830s houses on this block. And I had learned how to keep the historic character of the street without any change. You know, you don't have to go And yet make them substantially bigger. What we need is... My highest commitment is to make a place that's unique and beautiful and empowering to the people. I had been trying to purchase the property for two years and I'd given the owners, I think, 20 different offers and they rejected them all. No, no, no. There were seven heirs and one person refused to sign. Oh, Lou. I always said Lou was my Zen master because he'd be sick, he'd be this or be that. And all the other six relatives had to sue him to get him to sign the papers. And uh, 
Finally, he agreed to sign him, and here it is, 10, 10, 13. And he arrived in the car and he handed it out the window. <laughs> he said, here's the signed contract. And then I had nine months to get it approved. So you purchase an option, and that option is dependent on a series of things, approval by the old Georgetown board, approval of a bank appraisal. My goal is always to invest as absolute zero money if possible and do it all on selling ideas. That a bank sees such a great idea that they're willing to loan you money on it. We knew as a family in the 80s when we closed the Georgetown Theater that it couldn't sustain itself as a movie theater. This building had to become more than that. We had been approached by a dollar store and a restaurant, a bookstore. But when I saw Robert's passion for O Street and the revitalization of this part of Georgetown, how creative he was with space, I thought that if anybody could make the most of this piece of property here, it would be him. Yeah. What a mess. Congratulations. It's a rare thing for an architect to branch out into the development building world. It's such another sphere. It's a whole different career, really. So it's rare that you find somebody that actually does both. And we dream about doing both, but we don't always get to. One of the ideas in densification is always to create as much functional space as possible without changing the historic character of the building. So here we're restoring the theater facade, but at the same time we're trying to substantially increase the density by doubling the commercial space. So this first floor is what originally we had, about 4,000 square feet. We had to create a basement, double the space. To densify it, we had to come down 14 feet below where the original floor was. So we're slowly excavating all the dirt out. It's pretty complicated logistically to make this happen all through one door in the front of the building. Not to mention it's on Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown, which uh, is a 24-7 type of street. We expect the duration to be somewhere from 6 to 10 weeks. We are going to have one, two, three, four, five holes dug. We dug these miners' pits down 14 feet under the existing building. And then we put the footings in there, we put the steel columns in there, and now we're filling in the underpinning, in other words, extending the footings between each of the columns, getting up out of the ground, particularly in an old building, is an extremely slow process. The basement's a little that no complaint about that building. For a while there, we were going to be completely stopped until the underpinning went in, but now we got this new idea. Rather than wait for the underpinning to be completed, we had the opportunity to start um, the framing on the uh, upper levels while that's going on, and that's what we're trying to take advantage of. Don't stand underneath it, man. Put it through the hole over there. What we're planning to do is to run that steel beam through that hole from one side of the building to the other side of the building. And that steel beam will then be able to have the joist cantilever over it out to the face of that wall right there. And then we're also going to put a steel beam up above this roof just like that to allow that roof, the uh, third floor, to do the exact same thing. When that happens, these walls on the side will be stable. You know, they, they won't be able to collapse in any way because the top of them will be a rigid structure. So when that happens, we can take this whole wall down, all the way from the top down to ground level. We're um, working over top of the excavation crew. 
we're going to get this framing done on the uh, second, third, and roof level, and hopefully get a roof on this structure. And that way, the excavation can continue and, and be dry, and possibly even get the subcontractors in. Fantastic. <laughs> Just like getting the bones inside of the building. The foreman that I've hired, I've used before as my framing contractor. He's framed all my buildings. I hired him to do the management for everything. He has a beam that sits on top of this beam. Is that one too? And he's extraordinarily good. He just has a fantastic crew. They're totally a can-do, my kind of people. There's one more step, which is to get all the old walls tied to the steel. And once that's done, then we have this stable. I remember 44 years ago when I just came to Washington, D.C. The only thing I knew is Georgetown. It got lost, and I saw the sign of Georgetown. And I felt good, this is Georgetown, I'm here. I've been in Georgetown for the last 34 years, and I have seen the changes. I was working across the street, and I was always witness to the people who was going to the movie theater. The best night, usually for the movie theater, was a Friday night and Saturday night, there was a huge crowd in the front of it. And I remember there was an old gentleman. He was standing in the front checking the tickets. To be a member of a family that owns a movie theater was um, exciting because we got to see a lot of first-run movies because we were the only real movie theater around. All of us kids would run down here. We'd have the candy machine and the popcorn machine. All of our family members worked there at one time or another. My father would work in the box office. My brother was an usher. And it lasted for several years, showing great movies and very, very popular. It was different. When I was a Georgetown University student, my girlfriend and I saw Annie Hall at Georgetown Theater. Caliglia and the Georgetown Theatre were definitely one and the same. Everybody remembered Caliglia as part of life there. From 1985, went through some changes. It was not a movie theatre anymore. It was a totally different business for years and years and years. This is the part of uh, Wisconsin Avenue that kind of got neglected for a while. People would get to a certain point on Wisconsin Avenue. They thought there's nothing going on after that. And we are so happy that Robert took over. I think he's going to revitalize this, this short strip of uh, Wisconsin Avenue. And he's contributing to uh, making Georgetown even more iconic. As the owner, it's extremely important to be able to come back and forth to the site. My office is literally four doors away. What's really exciting about this project is that when you come down this cobblestone O Street, you see this movie theater, and the movie theater's perceptually is going to be unchanged. So let me explain the building, because I'll just slide it out of the ground here. So I'm actually adding a whole floor underground. And then there's a floor through here, which is, is commercial. So these two floors now will be commercial or retail or a restaurant. The layer up above them is offices. So this is all office windows. And then above that is residential. So when you slide it down in, 
you can see that you only see two and a half stories. The rest is underground. The one question that still remains is, what's the relationship of the big building to the historic carriage house? Now zoning requires, if I want to use this as a residence, and it would be really great residence, you would have to link it. So I have actually designed a little loggia that goes from the carriage house to the main house in the garden. It has been approved by the historic society, that is that it doesn't detract from the historical context and texture of the Georgetown neighborhood, but it requires a special exception from BZA, the Board of Zoning Adjustment, in order to build this loggia. There's a appeal that I have to go through and I want to send the chairman a notice immediately. I would hope that the board, on the merits of the case alone, will approve this permit application. That's the way to put it, actually. It's a big consumption of extra time. Taking the old roof out now underneath. And once that's gone, all the old structure is gone. In the interior. When I first looked at the theater, all I saw was light on the east side and the west side, but no possibility of light anywhere else. That is not nearly as incredible a building as if you have this whole long wall be light. I had restored other 1830s houses on this block. One side is light with windows, and the other side is blank with a wall. And you can have offices the whole length of a long building, and that's really valuable. People love light. And so when I first discovered this idea that it could have light, well, that was a eureka moment, let me assure you. What happened was I was wandering next to the building looking at it, and I noticed that between the bank and this building were these doorways and windows, which were plugged up. They'd been bricked up at some point. And that's the, the point at which I had somebody do a complete title search from 1800s all the way through to today. In that title search is when I discovered the easement, which said this owner always would have the right to put windows on the south side and that the owner to the south could not build anything in the area that might block that light. And once I saw that, it had the same possibility of the formula that I developed on the other three projects. But nobody else had any idea that that could be done. This is the where it got recorded, you know, originally. And then we had the letter with it from the Attorney General approving it. So it was quite, a, quite amazing. All the buildings I've done have had moments of anxiety, very stressful moments. Especially with this building because way up there in the front corner, when we first purchased it, we thought the corner of the building might fall off at any time. But we couldn't do anything about it because there was no way to know what was causing that. It was impossible to know. So it was only until we could demolish the interior and start to see that they had cut steel beams without resupporting them, 
put steel beams out in space that were holding up the whole front of the facade, leaving chimneys without any support for four floors down into the basement. Now I'm sure this one over here is the same way. Okay. Those are the moments that you really wonder, why are you doing this? The second thing, which is really difficult in a historic building, it's very unusual to be going down this distance, 14 feet under the existing building. It's a very daunting part. In fact, there are times when you don't sleep that well. There are very big problems that appear during design, during approval, during construction, and you just have to have a commitment that it's all going to work out. And it's not that I don't have anxiety or something, but I always try to make the distinction that a problem is something with imagination that you can solve or find a way around or will actually turn into something positive. You know, sometimes problems are the best thing you can have. You hear it trickling? Is it coming in? Yeah. Oh yeah, I see a little stream coming down. Yeah, you can hear it too. Oh, lordy. Well, that's an interesting problem. That's, that's our hard. underpinning. Yeah. And then it's coming around behind the underpinning. Over on this side, where the underpinning stops. Uh, but that might be a broken pipe. The water line. Yeah. Running in here. As we're moving towards the front of the building, we hope we'll understand where the sewer is. Right, right. Okay. But that's down below this. The lower the better, because we'd like all the water to run out of the building without the mechanical sump pump. But we'll just find out what happens. There's no normal. Some of the things that I've learned over the years is don't panic about things okay. like this. Ultimately, water gets solved. Yeah, you know. Until 9 o'clock last night. I always do something, but... This existing carriage house is completely crumbling. It's structurally unsound. The worry is if it just falls down immediately as you're trying to dig it. It is so in danger of down falling down, just like the front of the building was in danger of falling down. But this is even more derelict. In that foot and a half. The easiest thing would be to just take it down and rebuild it, but if the Historic Preservation Board doesn't want you to do that, they want you to preserve it to keep the historic character of the building. You wouldn't think so. Robert is really hands-on, able to make adjustments in real time that on many projects will require a lengthy period for multiple people to review it to make a decision where we can get a decision right away on almost everything. I get ideas all the time, especially anytime I'm just walking around and looking at what's there, just imagining alternatives. So we know the center of this is here. We got four inches and the four inch so, like 24 would be all right. What has become very apparent in the building of this building is how important that church steeple is. Okay, so the head of the bed is basically right here. And if you're lying in bed... And that we have the opportunity in this building to respond to it, to have the eyes of the building turn towards the view. And the space of masonry wall, not a frame wall. No, masonry So I know where the bed is going to be, and I'm making it so that that steeple, which is just fantastic, is what you see when you lie in bed, right? Now this one also looks straight ahead. That's great. great view out there too. I mean, this is a fantastic bedroom. This is pushing down. This is the 
that's exciting. That's architecture responding to what's specific about the site. This is the last delivery of steel framing. Now, the transformation of the building will be much faster and more apparent. One thing I believe in is that the more people who can live in a historic district and keep the historic character, the better. It just makes the town better. It keeps people from expanding outward. It's efficient. So in the ecological sense, it's really important to have it as dense as possible. The question in front of the Board of Zoning Adjustment was, would I be allowed to build this little piece here in that garden? And even though this is substantially less than could have been built in this property anywhere other than Georgetown, they denied this to me. So basically, they chose to not allow the carriage house to be residents. I'm going to proceed and do the carriage house as an accessory building as it's permitted. So it'll be an office. It's a fairly big disappointment. It doesn't fit with my concept of densification, but I'm just an architect doing my best. That was a great idea and it's over, so I have to think of another idea. <laughs> What we discovered when we took the sign down was that uh, there was so little framing in it vertically that uh, the only thing holding it together was the, was the formed sheet metal. And when we strapped it to the trailer in order to transport it back to the shop, we actually started to cave the sign in. It started to buckle under that pressure. What I told the guys at the shop was to build it exactly the way it was built originally, the same hem edges, the same butt seams the sheet metal bolted to the frame. This was a this is a brass base. It's kind of, you know, like it acts as a spring. We discussed the possibility of reusing the old letters, pulling the stainless steel off, but the gauge thickness was kind of thin. We were worried about damaging them in the process of removing them. They were just weathered over the years. It's going to be a new sign, but it's going to look exactly the way the old sign did.
The process is about three or four weeks. Neon is really the most time consuming part. Because there's four rows of neon, there's a lot of glass to bend. Did you just do it till it's kind of wobbly? You can feel it. Uh huh. So like a rubber tube. I'm going to take it and we'll set it on a pattern. And then we'll just take a block, make sure it's flat. And then we'll continue that all the way around the radius. Cool. Well, as you know, I inspect the building two or three times a day, and one of the problems is this back carriage house was just crumbling, and we'd gotten actually permission to tear down a substantial amount of it in order to protect the workers. And I happened to be checking that out. I'm constantly warning all the workers, be careful of the ladder. Ladders are where all the accidents occur. Get that ladder fixed. You know, I must say that 10 times, 20 times. And then I hurt myself on a ladder. I was actually in the car driving home from work and the phone rang and it was Robert and he said, you need to come get me. Robert was inspecting bricks in the carriage house and one of them came loose and he slipped and fell off a ladder. The brick that I was holding onto pulled out of the wall and I fell on my heel about six or seven feet off a step ladder. I immediately knew I broke my heel. It was just an extreme pain. So the way Robert climbs around on these sites has always been a bit of an issue for me because I know when he gets carried away with, with designs and strategies and ways of reconfiguring space, given that, it, it was not a surprise. It was like the carriage house was wreaking its revenge on me. Pretty quickly on, he was trying to figure out how to get around on the site. Mainly I was cursing because I knew it was really going to affect being able to build the building. That's why the bank required me to get one and a half million dollars of insurance in case I got seriously injured or died. And then I suddenly had this idea, well, maybe I could just have a residential elevator put in so I could get up and down. And if I push these stairs forward, like this, I would suddenly create a space opening between these two areas. And that space could actually go right up through the roof because it doesn't affect any of the floor plans above, and it could go all the way to the basement. So suddenly, I had an air shaft that could go from the basement to the roof. Now that's incredibly important because it means that I can rent the lower unit as commercial or as a restaurant and it will not affect any of the offices or residences above. That's a huge breakthrough. I'm always saying that when you have problems, it often opens up an opportunity you never would have imagined otherwise. And this is a perfect example of it. Robert was incapacitated for a lengthy period of time. We were able to use technology, particularly with FaceTime, so that he could look at the different phases and review questions and answer them while he was immobile. So we were able to um, move the project along. Now basically the building is completely enclosed. All that's left to do is put the front doors in and the canopy. This is what we've been struggling to do for a long time. At this moment in time, I'll be working on detailed surface design. So these are really crude sketches or quick sketches. I'm always going back and forth between the three media that I use. 
from sketch, computer, and model. What would the ceiling look like if it was a skylight? I might play with it here, but then I'll go over here and do it precisely. So here's the counter, columns, columns. The idea I'm working on right now is the idea that there could be a fire-rated window. You look through and see Georgetown. You'll actually get a little glimpse of O Street. It's like a little detail, but every one of these details counts for somebody who's walking in and looking at this building. The major job of the architect is to always have a vision on what the end will be versus all the parts. There are about six different crafts working on this building. If you are meticulous about the symmetry, the center line, in the end, you'll have something that looks really beautiful. And the one other thing that's really elegant is minimizing spaces which are not usable. So in this building, there's only one hallway. There are four floors. It's like a street, it's an interior street. This is a very messy place, detail-wise. And I'm thinking I might change the design one more time. It might be better just to bring this across and fill it, you know? Uh-huh. Nothing in here. Right, this would just be the flat, you know, an extended beam. Oh, that means you want to... Uh... What do you Tran think? is just fantastic. He's a magician yeah. with trim. We've been doing projects together for 30 years now. Robert is an architect in the classical tradition is very much of a composer and each little piece of molding is like a word in a song or poem. And if it's not right, he'll want to do it again until it's really singing the song that he wants to play. Gardening has always been part of my projects. I'm an avid gardener. This one has a wall garden, like a 18th century Charleston garden. The center tree is a focus. This gargantuan 60 foot high ash tree, which umbrellas all of the garden and becomes this wonderful view from the upper gardens where you're looking right into the branches. All my gardens have water features, but this building had a very unexpected water feature. We discovered there was a stream running right under the theater floor. For months, this stream would fill up the basement each night and it had to be pumped out before construction could continue. Suddenly I had an insight about the stream. It could be an environmental contribution by filling fountains and watering the garden. And I immediately saw this as a wall of water spouts pouring forth and making a magical pool below. My inspiration for the fountains was the river that creates the Tivoli Gardens in Rome. This is the business associations of Rome. This is what the business people think Robert, what you have done for Georgetown, thank you very much. The Georgetown Theatre, which undoubtedly was the most negative and run-down piece of property on all of Wisconsin Avenue. And they say that, you know, bad money drives out good. I wanted to change that. Next week, we will take down the shroud and you'll see the new stucco. It's completely restored. It should be fabulous for the next 100 years. And my commitment is that by making something extraordinary there, good money will bring in good money. So it's a privilege to have that opportunity in my life and uh, thank you for this award.
historically people would walk up to this point and then they would stop and they would say it doesn't look like there's anything beyond here and then they'd walk back again it's a big improvement i will say it's really really nice looking from outside he really did a good job and i'm glad he's making the neighborhood a lot nicer than what it used to be that's what we really needed I work for Jackstone Signs, and we're going to pick up this sign, we're going to drop the load line down, we're going to rig it up, and then we're going to put a tag line on it so we can control the load, then we're going to fly it into position and install the sign. I think the reborn sign looks spanking new. This Georgetown iconic sign everyone has photographed for years. I've been seeing the progress of this property and work and the patience of Robert Bell for the last three years. And today is his moment of triumph and, and he can show this off to people. It's really a wonderful job of design and genius of place. And that is, you always design with the terrain and the place in mind and how it all works together. So it's really cool to see civic leaders of Georgetown and Washington, D.C. here. And everyone's loving what this is. And they're seeing the apartments, they're seeing the office, they're seeing this space down here. And everyone's walking around smiling. The space is just wonderful. My family's here, and we are so proud to be here tonight. This is what we envisioned when we sold it to Robert a couple of years ago. We had no idea that it would be as beautiful as it is. What he has done uh, is beyond my expectations. I used to work in here as an usher. I started at 13. We're very, very happy. I'm very pleased to see the results on preserving and protecting Georgetown's historic district and this building is a wonderful example of that. Robert has started a renaissance in the middle of Georgetown because over the next couple of weeks and months, the next four buildings up the block are all going to undergo a renovation. And so we have a lot to look forward to right here in the center of Georgetown, the epicenter, so to speak, as we see Wisconsin Avenue and M Street become revitalized. So Robert, again, thank you for all of your efforts and thank you all for coming out tonight. I just couldn't build a building like this without all the fine craftsmen that have helped me. Greg Henry is sort of a modern John Henry. I had wonderful people doing the work of the project. Everything from the excavators, to the rough carpenters, to the amazing finished carpenters like Tran that I have working for me, the brick mason, and people I never met, like the man who did the wrought iron gate, and the welder in Pennsylvania. There's no way you can do this without a community that are great. Hey, my building gets celebrated in more ways than I ever expected. Wow, what a nice omen. <laughs>